I believe that I have previously said that eventually there'd be a video where I start taking Persona 5 into account with these analyzers. Well, this is that video. In fact, there'll be some pretty heavy spoilers in the last part of this video for reasons. Just be aware. This is a question that I think almost everyone who's ever worked with tarot cards ended up asking themselves at one point or another. What the hell is an hierophant? I, for my part, had my mind immediately jump to a mythical elephant dressed in the heroic garb of Hercules himself. Uh, but that's besides the point. I think I don't need to explain that an hierophant is in fact not a heroic elephant. The term hierophant is a Greek word related to the noun hiera, meaning something holy, and the verb phainein, meaning to show. This makes the hierophant a person who presents the sacred to the people, or in other words, a kind of priest. This means that this card is yet another male equivalent to the high priestess. You might now wonder why this card isn't called the high priest if that is true. The reason for that will sound surprisingly familiar once I go into explaining it. The Hierophant isn't the card's original name. Same as the Priestess, really. Now, I give you three seconds to think back to the Priestess episode I did and guess what the Hierophant's original name was, except I don't need to do that because you've all been looking at the artwork on the card that I've conveniently placed on screen for you and have already made the correct guess. That's right, just like the Priestess was originally called the Popus, the Hierophant was originally called the Pope. And he still is called that in some Italian and French decks. Unlike the Priestess's case though, figuring out why the card ended up with a new name named throughout the ages here is a lot less easy, given that the existence and veneration of a male pope is definitely not the sort of controversial subject that the idea of a female pope was. One theory that I've read suggests that the decision was made by makers of decks in order to both distance the tarot symbolism a bit more from the Catholic Church, yeah, great job there, you guys, and also to express the meaning of the card more unambiguously through the use of the Greek terminology. Because you see, the Hierophant isn't a mere priest. Just like the Pope himself, the idea behind the man sitting on the throne in the illustration of this card is that he's a medium of the divine, a connecting link between the true, incomprehensible nature of the sacred and humanity, interpreting the divine will into language and words that us mere mortals can understand, thus bringing upon us the true, God-given laws of the universe. Or at least that's what it should be like, if there weren't the itty bitty teeny tiny fact that by all his power and veneration, the Hierophant himself is still a human. He's fallible, can misunderstand, misinterpret, and even willingly falsify the divinity he receives. Yet he will still be held to be the ultimate authority on it, as he is the sole medium we have for it. That's what makes the Hierophant both an important spiritual guide, but also an incredibly dangerous figure. In the previous episode, I linked the Emperor to the Animus and to the Father Archetype. The Hierophant is deeply linked to both these archetypes as well, but in a very different way. If the Emperor is the father as the creator of laws and order, who takes raw materials and forms them into something new and structured, the Hierophant is the father as a mentor, who passes down knowledge to the next generation, sometimes without regard of whether or not this knowledge will actually still be relevant to them in the current age. To compare this to the High Priestess, another Pope character who also holds divine wisdom, which she is able to share, the Priestess usually keeps her wisdom to herself and shares it only carefully and with a cool passive demeanor, while the Hierophant shares his wisdom freely, actively and often recklessly, without reflection or regard for consequences. In fact, he tends to downright impose his divine authority to people in front of him, as represented by how he parades the symbol of the keys to heaven to his followers in the imagery of many of the decks. Nevertheless, he can also act as a kind, soothing, good shepherd to the people, if he doesn't abuse his power and responsibility. Responsibility. The Hierophant is traditionalism and conservative ideals personified. He passes down knowledge he has and things he believes to be unchangeable truths, instructing the people following him and seeking for his advice to act and think in a very specific way, all while believing himself to have the ultimate God-given authority to do so. 
In a nutshell, this arcana is about mentor figures, regardless of whether they guide or misguide their charges. And it is about knowledge, traditions and experiences from the past influencing the present, regardless of whether said knowledge really is as true as it's made out to be, or if it's really just old baggage dragging down one's progress. In the Persona series, the hero of Vendakana is represented by Kei Nancho, Shinjiro Aragaki, Bunkichi and Mitsuko, Mattis, Ryotaro Dojima, Sochiro Sakura, and a case could also be made for the big bad final boss of Persona 5 representing this Akana as well. Yeah, phew. Damn, that's a lot of characters to cover. And here I was thinking this video would be short for once. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this done already. Kane Andrew is a character firmly defined by his upbringing and the mindsets passed down in his family. He decides to surpass his neglectful parents at everything they do, in order to impress them and earn their attention, thus his obsession with becoming the number one man in Japan. Likewise, he also thinks of himself as a fountain of knowledge, that those around him should follow as a leader, a mentor figure, who knows what's best in every situation. This is shown clearly when Kei suggests leaving innocent people to die at two separate occasions during Persona 1, clearly believing that his way of handling things is the only way. Of course, this quickly earns him a rather undignified fist to the face courtesy of Mark Inaba. Oops. It's an interesting way for the character to connect to the Akana, representing the papal authority of the Hierophant much more than the people controlled by it. Of course, Kainanjo isn't the stranger to being guided by another mentor figure himself, as his ultimate persona, Yamaoka, takes the form of the butler who raised him like a father, mystified as a god through Kei's own perception of him. Now, I will admit that my grasp on Kei as a character is rather poor when compared to pretty much every other character I've ever spoken about on the show before, but it appears rather clear to me that his association with the hero of Fendakana is meant to express the importance that passing on knowledge and viewpoints holds in his life, both in his own attempts to guide others as well as in how he's been guided by his upbringing and by Yamaoka. Moving on from this, we skip directly from the Tadashi era of Persona games into the Hashino era with a slightly different approach to applying the Sakana. Representing the hero of Fantakana as a Persona user is Shinjiro Aragaki, lifelong friend and quasi brother of Akihiko Sanada, and culprit behind the accidental slaughter of Ken Amada's mother. Oops. At first glance, Shinjiro does make the impression of a smart, down to earth guy and a potential mentor figure, helping out Yukari, Chunpei, and yourself when you find yourself in a bind with the local gangs and dishing out some rather sound advice. However, it soon becomes apparent that this is not what this character arc is all about. In Shinjiro's case, his association with the Hierophant does not mean that he is the Pope with the authority to pass on knowledge and guide others. Whether he's someone defined and controlled, by experiences in his past. Throughout all of his appearance in Persona 3, Shinjiro is haunted by the death of a woman he caused by losing control of his persona. The experience defines him and informs a lot of his beliefs, which he considers to be universal truths of sorts. His bitterness, self-hatred and refusal to associate with people can all be traced back to his inability to let go of what he learned in the past and to move on beyond it. He's firmly in the grasp of an hierophant who preaches to him about his own sins. Still, a case could be made that, just like Nanjo, his association to the Akana used to come from him being someone who tried to guide others and pass on his experiences to them, an assessment that seems especially likely when one takes into account the way Shinjiro's past relationship to Akihiko and Akihiko's deceased younger sister, Miki, is described. At very least, he definitely shows shades of a mentor-like personality in the moments of his death when he tries to instruct Ken to not repeat the same mistakes that Shinjiro himself has made. 
The theme of being caught up in past experiences, unable to move beyond them, repeats in the same game with Bunkichi and Mitsuko, an elderly couple who are still trying to deal with the death of their son, a former teacher at Gekkokan High School. They not only project the image of their late son onto the protagonist, clearly treating them as a substitute for their child on more than one occasion, they also become obsessed with saving the persimmon tree planted in their son's memory from being felled in order to expand the school. It's only through the protagonist's influence that the couple learns to let past be past and allow the school to proceed with its expansion plans. We have one more character we need to cover before we can move on from Persona 3, a game that really seems chock full with this arcana, but at least we're able to move on to a different campaign of the game for this one. The final character associated with the hero of and arcana in Persona 3 FES is Mattis, the personified emotional shadow aspect of the traumatized Aegis, whose persona, Psyche, happens to be directly based on Shinjiro's caster, gameplay and status-wise. Still, Psyche's hero of and arcana is far more than just a relic from her being a texture swap of Castor, and is, in fact, directly related to Aegis' own character development during the answer. As I've mentioned, Metis is a shadow aspect of Aegis, born when Aegis cursed her own humanity and banished her emotions to her unconscious mind, unable to deal with the death of the protagonist. Metis represents all emotions Aegis felt towards the protagonist, good and bad, her obsession with protecting him, which manifests as an obsession of Metis in protecting Aegis, and her ability to laugh and cry with him. These experiences shaped Aegis and told her important things about what it means to be human. However, due to her trauma, these experiences became tainted and Aegis tried to force herself to forget about them, which is why it is not Aegis herself representing the hero of and Arcana in the answer, but Metis, in all her childish emotional glory. As much as the memories Metis represents have caused Aegis to become trapped in her own past, Metis also has a lot of valuable knowledge and guidance to give to Aegis, if Aegis herself only manages to see past the pain. Phew, so much for Persona 3. Okay, okay, moving on. Aha! Coffee dad number one! Ryotaro Dajima, represent! Yuna Dokami's uncle and detective of the Yasuo Inaba PD, Ryotaro Dojima, takes the role of a father figure to our protagonist in the game, providing shelter to him and acting as his legal guardian for the entire year Yu spends in Inaba. As a policeman upholding law and order in Inaba, he is an unquestioning believer in societal rules and guidelines, which reflects in his treatment of the protagonist, such as when he forbids you to leave the house at night, even though evidently all of his friends are allowed to, and in the harsh way he scolds him and his daughter Nanako whenever they do anything he deems as misbehavior. This is what leads him to distrust you enough to eventually outright take him in for police questioning, which accidentally leads to Nanako's kidnapping. Oops. Hmm, I've been saying that a lot today. Dojima is also a hopeless workaholic, to the point that he will often prioritize his job over family matters, a quality which has estranged him from his daughter over time. The reason for this obsession of his is, of course, a tragic one, as Dojima is burying himself in work as a way of coping with the death of his wife, Chisato, which has been haunting him as a personal failure of sorts for two years. Much like Shinjiro, the elderly couple and Aegis, Dojima is allowing his past to rule his actions in the present, unable Able to reflect on how this behavior of his is affecting the current state of his family. It takes Nanako running away from home, being kidnapped and almost dying for Dojima to realize that he needs to live in the present if he wants to be a good father and teacher to his daughter. Talking about being a good father, conveniently this brings us right to Coffee Dead 2 The Curry Chronicles. Sochiro Sakura is a character very, very similar to Ryotaro Dojima in a lot of respects. He takes the protagonist in as a legal guardian, is incredibly strict and repeatedly urges him to uphold societal rules, serves some coffee, of course, and also turns out to be the father of a girl close to you. Of course, Sochiro is even stricter in his actions than Dojima is, but that can be explained with the much more dire initial circumstances of his first meeting with the protagonist, as well as the fact that Sochiro has been severely disillusioned by his previous job as a government worker and the corruption and injustice he witnessed in it. Basically, Sochiro is a character who starts out believing that the world is crap and everyone needs to just step back and deal with it, a lesson he fiercely and religiously tries to pass on to the protagonist. 
The fact that he had to see how the assassination of one of his best friends, Wakabaishki, was just done off as a suicide and buried with the files probably did not help. Much like Dojima, the key to getting Mr. Sakura to open up to believing in a better future is showing him that the only way to reach it is to stop focusing on the past. Which is accomplished first by saving Futaba from her hikikomori syndrome and suicidal urges, then strengthening the familial bonds between Futaba, Sojiro and the protagonist by keeping Futaba safe from her abusive uncle. All these things are important steps in proving to Sojiro that the pessimistic submissive worldview he tried to mentor Choker and Futaba in was not even remotely the unchanging changeable universal truth he believed it to be and allows him to move past it, becoming a much better mentor figure to the protagonist and father to Futaba in the process. Alright, I think that covers all of the characters then. Well everybody, it's been a long time, but I'm glad to finally get this video out to you and I think we all can learn from this arcana that, uh, oh, what's that? Oh no, oh no 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 <sighs> yelled a bath. The big bad Demiurge himself. Yet another one in a long line of demons and deities who just think we humans like being destroyed. I thought I'd be done with this video after talking about Sojido, I really did. But reading up on the arcana, I stumbled upon an interpretation that suggests that the hero fans archetype is tied deeply into the concept of the demiurge. And yes, upon thinking about it, I really can't finish this video without at least talking about it. <sighs> This will require some explanation. You know how in Persona 5 Yelda Bath keeps going on and on about how he's God and his world is law, blah, blah, blah. Well, the character is based on a figure from Gnostic law, known as the Demiurge. Very grossly simplified, in Gnosticism it is believed that the material world wasn't created by the true creator God, but by a lesser deity, who was merely channeling a tiny, tiny part of the divine truth, yet mistakenly believes itself to be supreme. This fake, misguided god is known as Yeldabath, the Demiurge. The parallels to the Hierophant Arcana are immediately visible. Just like how the Pope believes himself to be absolute despite being fallible, so does the Demiurge, imposing himself as the one true god upon the world, even though he only holds a tiny misguided fragment of the true divine wisdom. This makes the Demiurge the ultimate representation of the reversed Hierophant Arcana, and Persona 5's Yelda Bath is a perfect fit for it. Representing the will of all those who want to be mindlessly ruled by society, rather than standing up and fighting for their own destiny, Yelda Bath is the ultimate consequence of the mindset Sojiro tried to impose onto the protagonist. An inhumane, heartless collective will who cares for nothing but upholding the established rules of society, even if it means erasing the individual. One look at Yelda Bath tells you all you need to know about the consequences of falling into the traps of the Hierophant, the dangers faced by every character related to it, including Kei, Shinjido, Bunkichi, Mitsuko, the Aigas who bore Metis, Dojima and Sojiro. Yelda Bath is the personification of the demon all of them were struggling with, the urge to lazily cling to tradition, society and the past, mourning it, instead of standing up and fighting for a brighter future for themselves. I've said that all arcana are technically relevant to everyone, and the Hierophant is a good example in that. Life keeps presenting us with both wisdom from the past acting as solid advice, but also with outdated, lazy mindsets that people cling onto because it is convenient. It is our personal responsibility to critically determine what we really believe in, and whether the Hierophant is guiding us like a good mentor, or leading us astray, blinded by his own pride. Distinguishing between truth and dogma can be very difficult, but I think we live in a time when it's become more important than ever. Well, that turned out a lot more serious than I expected it to. Anyway, I'm really glad this video is finally out. Remember when I said that this wouldn't take another six months? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I'm just really annoyed with myself because... <laughs> It's not just because I'm disappointing you guys, I'm disappointing myself. I've been wanting to get to the point where I can upload like one video a week without 
problem, but I'm starting to realize that editing is just a very, very tiresome job. And if I want to do this, I either have to scale back on the amount of editing I do, or I'll just have to do more less edited videos, I guess? Videos that don't really require me to jump through so many hoops to get all the footage and cut it and put stuff and filters over it and what do I know? You know, stuff like the rant video I did about Persona 5. That one worked out really fine and that didn't take me a day to make. So yeah, probably you should probably expect me to do more videos like that and at least m once a month I'll try to throw in a highly edited video such like this one. And I mean, I do have to finish the Arcana analysis. I mean, that's what you guys are here for. And talking about what you guys are here for, just a short while back, and I mean like one month back, this channel reached 1000 subscribers. <laughs> Honestly, this is really amazing for me. It's, it's a great milestone. I could never have imagined that with my spotty uploading schedule, I could ever managed to get that many people interested and it's just a huge honor to me to know that there are so many people who are interested in my content like watching it and who can take something away from it and it really just makes me glad to know this and that's why I want to do something for this milestone. Now obviously it can't be like a highly edited video that would just defeat the point of me trying to do more less edited videos so I can like crank up video production a bit but I do think that I will be able to do something like short and fun, something that doesn't require me to cut around a lot and stuff like this. And I'm not entirely sure what I should do yet because a Q&A, I don't know if you guys would be interested in a Q&A. So I'm asking you guys, what is a kind of video that you'd like me to do uh, in honor of the thousand subscribers milestone. I'll take your suggestions in the comments, just write whatever comes to your mind, I'll look through all of the suggestions and come up with what I think, what I think, I need to learn to enunciate, with what I think is the best way to celebrate this occasion. I'll try to crank out even more content for you guys from now on. I've even ordered a new microphone in hopes that it will be better. Anyway, that's it for me for now. I'm super psyched about this. I hope I'll see you guys soon. Well then, bye!